So actually, this is a joint work with my colleague from York, Jerry Swan, for whom we pursue different avenues towards program synthesis uh, in the last few years. And overall, I would say uh, uh, we deal with program synthesis. So that, that's, that's our actually uh, research area, which may be understood as automatic generation of programs from all sorts of users' intent, where that intent actually can be understood in many different ways. Uh, here in this work, we actually assume that the intent of the user is given by a set of examples or, or tests or input-output output pairs that somehow you know, express what the sh program should do. Um, but there are other ways, and you definitely know, especially after such excellent talks like the previous one by Professor um, Altenkirch and, and others, that there, there's a possibility for synthesizing programs from formal specifications like contracts, like preconditions, postconditions. And uh, there's actually quite sizable community of people that actually do that uh, within FPAIR community, but also outside of it. Uh, it's maybe also worth actually mentioning that quite recently new forms of user's intent have been taken into account and there are quite interesting recent developments where actually deep learning can be used to actually try to synthesize programs from natural language and actually we've been engaged in that sort of research too. So for those of you who are not very, you know, like you haven't used program synthesis in practice, then maybe mentioning just a few success stories of it may be worth like uh, Flashfill, a feature of Microsoft Excel, uh, where if you, you can fill just a few values in two columns and Flashfill will actually induce from that a program, a formula that will generalize that behavior on these, two, on these examples uh, towards actually any input. And uh, you know, that from the viewpoint of an end user that just looks like a, just one of the features of Excel, Microsoft Excel, but actually as a matter of fact, beneath it, you know, under the hood, there's quite complex program synthesis you know, engine that actually uh, formulates this task and solves it. Uh, okay, so um, we, uh, the, the, no, I come actually, my background mostly is, is mostly in artificial intelligence and meta heuristics. Uh, I'm also aware that here in the functional programming community has also pursued different sorts of or, or avenues towards program synthesis, where this is typically formulated in categories of property-based uh, uh, testing, where the idea is we have some program generator and then the, the, the candidate programs generated by the, that generator can be somehow verified or tested by tools like quick check, small check, and, or, or the Scala equivalent, Scala check, type of tools you, you some of you may have heard yesterday if you attended the, the, the lecture by, by Professor Hughes. Um, the community of people who do meta heuristic search, uh, they uh, actually follow a much more messy approach, uh, which is most of it is actually falls into the category of genetic programming, where the idea is basically to apply evolutionary computation to synthesize programs. And where, as you know, you know, evolutionary algorithm in general evolves a population of candidate solutions and you know, is somehow guided by a fitness function that you know, differentiates, the, differentiates them. And in, in case of genetic programming, the idea is that those candidate solutions are programs. They are being modified using some search operators and they are being evaluated using some fitness function that actually, that for instance, in the context of synthesis based on examples, actually that fitness function counts how many tests, how many examples my candidate programs pass. And of course, I terminate the search as soon as my program actually passes all tests. And of course, it's worth mentioning that, that this is purely inductive, meaning that, of course, we don't have proof of correct correctness this is, we, we assume or we hope that those programs synthesized in such a way uh, behave correctly on any input. Uh, so that, that's, that's, you know, basically there are two communities that, that do not seem to talk much to each other. So uh, what we did in this work is basically trying to combine these two threads and I would say borrow some concepts, some ideas from functional, from functional programming to actually, okay, thank you. Uh, to actually uh, make it more principled, yeah, and make actually the search for candidate programs uh, in stochastic space, in, in stochastic uh, um, way, uh, more principled, more, st more structured, and thus more efficient and effective. Uh, so, so that's that's our goal. Uh, so, you know, 
basically, if our goal is program synthesis, then actually in the long run, we would like to actually make all of us you know, unemployed, uh, at which point you would like probably me, ask me to leave. Yeah? But of course, I can calm you down that actually we are not there yet. Of course, uh, synthesizing complex programs yes, is actually beyond uh, technical possibilities now. Uh, we you know contemporary methods are not capable of synthesizing anything that is longer, just a, you know, longer than, a, I would say, a, a dozen of lines of code, maybe 20 lines of code or something like this, or 20 statements. Uh, that problem is difficult because actually from the optimization perspective, from the heuristic perspective, we are talking about actually combinatorial optimization. It's not like optimizing functions or continuous functions over Cartesian spaces where we have some continuity. We can assume that if we modify a solution, then actually the fitness function or objective functions will vary only slightly. Here, you know, we know from experience, we all know from experience actually changing a program even a little bit, you know, just you know, swapping, that just maybe replacing one character may completely change the semantics of a program. So that's a challenging task. And actually what we do in this particular work actually is actually focusing on even, I would say, the more challenging part of it, namely uh, synthesis of recursive programs. Here, uh, this is becoming even more tricky because recursive <coughs> programs are particularly brittle in the sense that if you modify an existing recursive program, then it's very likely that it will fail on not a single test, but actually m multiple tests because, because of the recursive calling. Then, of course, it's also very easy for recursive programs to be ill-formed in the sense that they, may, they just execute you know, infinite recursion and actually they never stop. So you have to safeguard against that. And typically in genetic programming, for instance, this is done in quite, I would say, messy manner. So uh, what we tried in this study, what we tried to do is actually combining or borrowing some ideas actually from algebraic data types and recursion schemes to make stochastic or heuristic synthesis of, of uh, recursive programs more, uh, more, uh, more efficient. So actually I'm pretty happy that you know, I, I, I don't think I have to introduce certain basic concepts that have been actually reiterated many times during this conference, also uh, in the previous talk. Uh, so what, what, what comes you know, as our aesthetic point are algebraic data types uh, with those three basic constructs of disjoint union, Cartesian product, and, and exponentiation. Where actually we exploit, at the moment, we exploit mostly, mostly these two, uh, namely the, uh, namely the, uh, sorry, uh, namely the um, exponentiation, uh, the disjoint union in, in Cartesian product. Uh, and you know, this example should be trivial for you, I guess. You know, how, you know, ADTs are so common in Haskell that actually nobody really talks about them too much, I guess, you know, when, when programming some, you know, some, some basic data types. Uh, in Scala, it's actually a, a bit more verbose. I'm mentioning Scala because actually this is the language in which the framework we develop actually is written. Um, but you can still see that the int list uh, type is uh, basically disjoint union of nil and cons, while cons is, uh, is a Cartesian product of head and tail. And, and you can see those, those composite uh, data types. And of course, what it, it facilitates is, is, is writing uh, functions that actually calculate certain things using pattern matching like list length in this particular example. So that's, I think that's an elementary thing for you. Uh, what may be not so obvious, although has been mentioned in that previous talk, is that uh, you know lists are obviously composite for for us. You know, no sane person would say that you know a list is an atomary type. Yeah? There's a composition, yeah? inherent composition there. But uh, there are many types. Actually, virtual all familiar types are composite in the sense that even natural numbers yeah, can be seen as as uh, algebraic data types, like for, for instance, the type for natural numbers as expressed as disjoint union of zero and successor. Uh, so, so that opens the door to synthesizing programs that do not necessarily, of course, operate on lists, but also on those types that are um, no, not always considered you know, uh, uh, composite. The other you know, thing we borrow from functional programming are recursion schemes. Uh, which are, again, very well known to you. And I would say definitely a very didactic example of, this, of, the, of them is folding lists. So we have a fold function for, for lists, for actually more specifically for lists of ints, uh, where I would say, from my perspective, as I understood, understand that and I like to picture that, is basically that fold or recursion schemes sort of externalize recursion. Yeah? They, they delegate recursion to, I would say, to the library and the recursion 
is not visible anymore in my code, in the client code. It's more like implicit recursion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so and given this definition of faults over lists in Scala, I can now rewrite the length function in a very concise way in which I say that uh, for a given list L, for the base case of type nil, uh, that function should return zero. And for the uh, case of the const type, uh, I have a function that can uh, somehow what it does, it accumulates the value of the accumulator as you know, along the list as the computation proceeds. Or of course, we could even write it shorter using some anonymous function if you prefer. But that should be obvious. Again, uh, that uh, uh, you, I guess, again, most of you probably know that, but maybe not all, all of you, that fold is actually a very special case of a more general uh, recursion scheme, which is called catamorphisms. Basically, a concept taken from category theory, uh, which happens to be formally written most often in this quite weird way. We have those banana brackets, uh, which are, uh, uh, sorry, again, uh, in which, between which you actually place all those cases corresponding to the elements of that disjoint union. And then, for instance, for that uh, length, uh, the length of list example, you can express uh, very succinctly this particular. Uh, semantics by saying that for that case one, which corresponds to the uh, empty list, you should return zero, and for uh, that case uh, compo well, corresponding to cons, uh, you have an expression that given list and accumulator simply or maps it to accumulator increased by one, uh, which again may be nicely written now. Actually, the the the, the catamorphism for uh, for uh, uh, um, for list of nuts may be expressed in this way. Where specifically, actually, we have we have actually this particular implementation is generic in the type of accumulator, because it actually it could be anything. So the whole idea we we present present here and we publish just published in the paper is that we can take ADTs and catamorphisms and uh, in a, and, and combine them in a method that synthesizes recursive functions, and we do that in hope of improving both effectiveness and efficiency. Effectiveness meant as you know, being able at all actually to synthesize a working function and efficiency uh, meant as you know the computational effort that is needed by a method to actually browse or actually the scan the space of candidate solutions and finally find the correct program. And the, the method actually is a I would say quite natural implication of what I already said. Namely, uh, we have two phases. In first phase, we automatically derive uh, uh, the case expressions from the specification from, from the cases, yeah, from the cases itself. Because as I will see an example in a moment, our you know, problem is given by the set of static examples and the type of the uh, of the argument. So we, uh, yeah, so we have uh, here uh, some some domain domain specific knowledge that helps us, for instance, to determine whether what is the type of accumulator, and this part is. To be frank, not yet entirely automated in our implementation because some certain minor problems with Scala. But we can still actually, what we can do, we can, for instance, uh, assume that we first try to run the method with accumulator, which is a single int. Then we can actually run this method with accumulator, which is a couple of, couple of ints and so on, a pair of ints and so on. And uh, yeah, and then, um, uh, so, so that, that's the first stage. It's so basically automatic, I would say, derivation of those cases. And then once we have those cases in those banana brackets, so to say, then we actually uh, run stochastic program synthesis for each of those cases separately, where the practical upshot and the advantage is that those, that those functions that handle those cases, those, those pattern matters, are non-recursive anymore. So there's no risk of running into infinite recursion there. So it has to work in a sense. Yeah? There's a question only whether that will find the solution or, or not. And actually, this can be even that search can be performed using uh, systematic search or heuristic search, whatever you prefer. There, and uh, actually, what we did, what we used in this particular study, we employed a piece of software we developed in a software project, which we call Containment, uh, which is a quite, I would say, nifty package, uh, because actually it automates a lot uh, of what is going on when you synthesize programs. Meaning, uh, you don't have to specify the uh, the components uh, 
you don't you, temp that the container actually do doesn't even need to see your source code. Actually, it, it, what it needs is a jar file because we are talking about JVM-based um, um, programming languages, and it actually derives the uh, derives the grammar that is needed to handle to actually to synthesize different expressions directly from that uh, jar file, uh, and then it performs according to that grammar. It performs the search. So that grammar. The, the grammar derived by contain and from uh, the jar file could look like this, where you can see the elements corresponding to, actually, to the, um, sorry, to the um, uh, cases of uh, of uh, zero and uh, cons, and then you see also the elements corresponding to uh, the expressions that can be built when you handle those cases. So, for instance, that you can express um, different. Um, uh, different arithmetic expressions like adding two national numbers, multiplying them, or dividing them, according, you know, given or based on the on the on the jar file that actually contained that code, and this is basically done automatically. So, so to show you, like, you know, how this could work, uh, here is the example of actually the. I'm sorry, this it's a really weird uh, behavior. Uh, Assume that what we want to actually synthesize is a successor function in Scala. We have a set of, of uh, examples that are used to induce that, uh, that program. We would like to actually induce this code shown here in this slide. And what uh, container does, actually, our method first automatically derives those case expressions from, from the jar file. Um, and then, uh, actually, uh, those, those cases are being partitioned you know, accordingly to the cases, because of course it doesn't make sense to synthesize a program based on cases that are not consistent with the with the case, uh, and then we run stochastic synthesis on all those uh, on each of those cases separately. And of course, that was just a toy example. What we did in the paper is actually running that on much more demanding functions like those mentioned in this slide. And to cut a long story short, uh, what we found out is that it, this is immensely efficient compared to other three methods that are shown in the first three columns. So our approach are two last columns uh, in this slide, where AP is a, our approach that uses ant programming, which is bio-inspired approach you know, of, of heuristic search, while Kata, Kata RS is actually completely random search. It turns out that actually this approach, by partitioning the task, uh, decomposing the task into different you know, case classes, and, and actually uh, making uh, recursion completely implicit is so effective that even random search is sufficient to actually solve this with that within minutes. These problems actually are even, even, even seconds. So of course, one of those methods, as you can see, is actually on, on par on our, with our method, that's CTGGP, but actually in terms of efficiency, meaning the required computational effort, it's, it's, it's much worse. So uh, the conclusion, the working conclusion is that uh, ADTs and recursion schemes are extremely helpful for you know, heuristic synthesis of functions. And you know, they somehow structurize the searching search process to, to the extent that actually makes them solvable, those problems with just random search. And uh, you know, but actually there's we find that there's there's much more potential in that. Namely, first of all, we can talk about or consider applying this to other algebraic data types, like for instance, uh, catamorphisms, not on lists, but for instance on trees, yeah? which is way beyond you know, what normally fold can do. Also, you may know that there are there actually catamorphisms is not the only recursion scheme. There are many more of them. Uh, a few of them are listed in this slide. Catamorphisms, you know, they actually you know, like somehow compress the complex data structures into accumulator value. We have, but we have also anamorphisms, which just do the opposite. They start with a single value, they decompress it into the data structure. You can compose them, so hyromorphisms are basically anamorphisms composed with catamorphisms, and if you implement factorial, then basically this is what you do, even implicitly, and so on. There are like 20 of them, and, and there's a lot of potential in that. And uh, at the end, I would just mention that, uh, you know, a part of our efforts is also becomes so, so you know, uh, fruitful that we actually founded a company, a, a spin-off that somehow tries to popularize this approach and more specifically, this container and actually technology that we, uh, that I mentioned here. Uh, so actually, we turned it into a commercial product, which is called Tiffin, uh, where Tiffin is basically an 
automatic, automatic uh, let's say, uh, online program configurator, a software configurator that can, can actually automatically harvest some components from the uh, jar files and then try to optimize them or re rearrange them uh, according to some function or should some optimization function, some, some, some goal that is expressed as a fitness function, let's say. And we have a range of use cases uh, that show that this is immensely efficient and allows us to actually bring uh, uh, quite, quite substantial benefits in different aspects like speed up, memory occupation, or even, even, uh, even energy consumption. And of course, we are looking for potential customers or, or people that would like to be to, to interested in, in working with this uh, sort of tools. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And we have time for some questions. OK. Uh, may I ask, uh, when you uh, go to s the stochastic way, uh, the evolutionary way uh, especially, you sometimes uh, get to some surprising uh, solution uh, you wouldn't uh, think about uh, in advance. Have you seen something like this? That, that's very interesting. Yeah, indeed, you know, uh, evolutionary algorithms are famous for being quite inventive and actually being capable of uh, finding solutions that are not natural for humans. To be frank, in this particular study, it did not happen because, you know, those... Uh, case handling functions are so simple in the sense that actually uh, in most cases, as I mentioned, even random search was capable of finding them pretty quickly. But you're right, we have uh, overall in evolutionary computation we, and, and in the genetic programming, we have a bunch of very interesting examples of evolution finding some alternative uh, you know, solutions to what people uh, designed or even sometimes solutions that are more efficient than, uh, for instance, in hardware in particular. Uh, there's a group, for instance, of, of, of researchers uh, from the Czech Republic who, who actually work uh, on GP applied to hardware, and they manage to, for instance, produce very efficient multipliers or others that use much lower number of gates uh, in, in implementation. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's one of the examples, but there are more. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one question. Okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's a uh, very interesting idea of optimizing. Like, uh, uh, can you elaborate a bit? Did I get right that you were uh, somehow parsing the bytecode of the jar? And like, uh, how did you um, prove that uh, there is that the interfaces were still working the way they're supposed to work? And like, did you? Uh, think about like because from version to version JVM also modifies and you can get different results and you can get uh, down uh, uh, you, you can downgrade the performance and things like that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, I would say uh, given or assuming that the data types given as the starting point to Tiffin or container and are correctly implemented and for instance they form alternative implementations of different functionalities but they have the same interface they can be swapped uh, one for another then assuming that we are pretty much certain that tiffin is not capable of actually breaking anything uh, while actually it has that potential of improving some non-functional properties like improving the you know, execution times or other properties uh, of course you know uh, so, so in, because we operate in that closed world of components that are given by the user yeah, and are, we assume about them that they are correctly implemented, then as long as this is true, we cannot break anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you're right that in general, metaheuristic search is, is of course suboptimal, doesn't guarantee you with have, doesn't give you guarantee of providing correct or I would say optimal solution. But in the worst case, you end up, or you may decide to keep the you know, previous solution, you know, the original provided by, by, the, what's it, by a human, uh, and that's the, that's the worst scenario. Uh, otherwise, if you find anything that is better on some objective, on some criterion, you can swap it, you, know, you can replace. Okay, so uh, we should thank our speaker again. Yeah.